Hey Print Hustlers, Bruce from Printavo here, Simple Shop Management Software. We've got a very special guest this week on the podcast. We've got Kevin Oakley from Stoked On Printing out in Las Vegas. How are you feeling, What's going Kevin? on? Feeling good, man. <laughs> feeling good. We're almost to the weekend, so I'm loving it. That's awesome. How's everything been going last couple of weeks now? Good. Just on a base level, it's getting a little bit cooler. So we're actually in the low 100s, not like 115, 116. It's dry heat, so though. It's dry heat. It's, it's dry heat, yeah. So, um, you know, it starts to get to you after a while. Like you, every year, it's like, all right, you know, we don't think it's going to get that hot. And then it just gets super hot and it just starts to like wear you down a little bit. So I think, uh, you know, even just being stressed, but then being super hot the whole time, you're like, ah, it, you just can't get away. But, um, yeah, other than that, it's been really good. You know, uh, it's been a wild year, but um, you know, it's it's looking looking really good. That's awesome. Tell us just a little bit about Stoke Don for folks who haven't heard of you or hasn't seen the Instagram. We started back in about like 2007, 2008, and I was just in my uh, business partner Shane's uh, extra bedroom. So we just started because we were touring around in bands, we we're playing in bands, a very similar story to a lot of other people in the screen printing world. And we just decided, hey, we're just going to start printing our own shirts, more so out of just a necessity to have the availability of not having to order so many shirts. Uh, we could just kind of print as we went. One thing led to another. We started printing for some other bands. We started printing for some other businesses. And around 2010, we moved into our first actual warehouse. Uh, it was like a 1400 square foot warehouse and it was a it was a ton of fun because we were just out of high school so you know i was just 19 years old so i was still living with we were still living with our parents so it was kind of fun just to have like our own space and you know we were like we can do whatever we want here so you know it was really cool just to have that freedom to uh explore different business opportunities all that stuff we had you know we had shows, we had parties, we had all those types of things at the shop too. Um, so it was kind of a nice place for all of our friends to kind of come together. And then we kind of started moving into the contract world. We got in contact with one uh, customer who was a promotional product distributor. And we thought, hey, this How'd you is get a print- in contact with them? He was using another shop. That shop had gotten hit by lightning. So their power blew up, blew up right? So this guy is just kind of, you know, searching the web. He knew somebody that we did one run for like way back in the day. And he was like, Hey, you should talk to these guys. And so he just kind of showed up one day and he was like, Hey, you know, I got all these orders. Do you guys want to, you know, print them at that point we were doing, you know, you know, we were just doing small 36, you know, 50 piece orders for just, you know, businesses. And this guy's bringing in, you know, consistent 100, 500 volume orders. So um, you're obviously not making as much, you know, so that was kind of a little, a difference. But then once you start to see, okay, Hey, uh, you know, we're going to have consistency of work so we can kind of bank on growing, you know, because that's the hardest thing is the feast or famine business sometimes is you never sure. know when you're going to get that next order. So it was, you know, it was kind of nice. So we, you know, we were like, all right, let's, you know, let's explore this world. You know, let's, let's kind of see what's needed, you know, where we can fit in, you know, in this world. And uh, we did that for probably about like five to six years, you know, of just strictly being in the promotional product space as a contract printer to those people and kind of grew, grew and grew and grew from there. Um, and then about in 2017 ish, 2018, we really kind of started diversifying ourselves as far as our customer base. We get, went a little bit more direct. We brought in some more direct business. Why did you guys decide to make that decision from really diving in? Cause it sounded like you were trying to focus heavily on contract and then all of a sudden trying to get more direct. Was it uh, a deeper margin obviously selling direct or, or what yeah so there was that and there was also just the fear of being so dependent upon one industry and the somewhat of a like a shift in the way uh contract people are going to function in the future how promotional product uh, distributors are going to be buying products in the future you know when you talk about alpha broder getting into decoration and you have larger promotional product suppliers like hit promotions getting into the space, you know, so you start thinking about, okay, well, the model of promotional product distributor buying from Alpha Broder sending to a printer is, is kind of cumbersome. You know, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff that when you take out, uh, you know, that uh, Alpha Broder going to a contract decorator, you reduce the amount of friction. So we kind of saw that and we're like, I don't know if we can compete with Alpha Broder and I don't know if we can compete with hip promotion. So 
it's just from uh, the convenience of the supply chain it, it's it's quicker for them yep yeah and, and and as far as most promotional product there's no other product in their space that does that this type of model right you don't buy keychains from you know someplace and then send it to a pad printer you know you buy from a keychain supplier so it makes sense in their world to just kind of simplify it and some some of the older uh people in the space this is just how they've been doing it um but we even have some you know younger reps inside of their uh, company that are like well why don't we just buy the printing from alpha broder and i was like oh okay this is going to be a problem <laughs> this, you know as as those uh, that older model so um, you know, so we've been combating that too. You know, we, we just launched a new website called contractdecorators.com. Um, and it's a single invoice solution. So essentially we're just passing on, you know, our case pricing onto the distributor and then you can add decoration and all that stuff onto the, on the site. So we're, we're trying to compete there a little bit, but you know, there's only gonna be so much we can do. Interesting. I know there's been a lot of chit chat, uh, online especially around that model of of the distributors being able to dive in and do their own decoration especially with them having so much uh the customer data i feel like people were they were feeling funky about it right which i completely understand but to your point which is 100 percent valid in that it is more convenient right if they do good work it's they have the goods they, they have the you know for them to vertically integrate absolutely makes sense it does yeah and uh when you look at a company like alpha broder they're they're vc backed um you know and what venture capitalists want to see is growth so there's only so many t-shirts that they're going to be able to sell so they're going to say well what other verticals can you go into and they're going to say well we could decorate the shirts too and we're going to bring in that all of that revenue back into the company and they're going to go okay well how much money do you need for that they might say 50 million dollars to start and they're going to go okay here's the check get it build the build the warehouse you know build the shops buy the buy the machines i think they're going to have like an issue with growing because you know they have such a huge customer base they're going to have a hard time uh competing with us as decorators at the beginning because we are so specialized you know they're not going to be able to do simulated process they're not going to have all these offerings they're going to be able to do left chests and full fronts and they're going to go for the promotional product people you know and what they sell the most of so you know, there, there's a lot of value that us decorators still bring to the table that they're not going to take away. But to be upset at them, it's wasted energy, in my opinion, because sure. you can't control it. You know, so what you can control is, you know, what else is there in the world, you know, that we can use our services for? Yeah, no, 100 percent. Just the natural flow of, of capitalism and how it moves around. Tell me a little bit about the transition, though. So, you know, wanting to get more into direct. How did that work? Did you did you, did you start having to do the sales? Did you have to bring on somebody to help? Uh, obviously, it's a big shift in pricing, in workflow, all of that. Yeah, so we never completely removed ourselves from some direct business, you know. So even while we were doing contract, we still had a, a small amount of you know, I would say 25% of our sales was still direct. My goal was to get that to 50%, you know, so we're 50, 50, obviously the volume on the contract side is going to be a lot more shirts to get to 50%, but I just wanted at least our revenue to be 50, 50. And it just kind of went back to the drawing board. Like where do we fit in and where do we bring value that we're not and just compete on price. So that was really one of those things where we said, what is needed out there? And what we essentially saw was, oh, okay, well, I think the model of, you know, selling bulk amount of t-shirts to people is a very saturated market. Anybody who who can buy a press can compete in that market. We saw uh, where we could have a little bit more of a, like a moat around our business was to focus on technology. Like how can we improve the customer's experience through technology and make things better and more seamless and for them and and most of all for us because the faster that we can process an order the faster we can print an order the faster we can ship all correlates to value to the customer you know and people will pay for that people will pay for a consistent product and a consistent shipping in a short amount of time so you um, talked about two things there. There's speed and there was transparency, it sounded like. Speed as far as just getting the turnaround time as quick as possible with a quality product. But then you're also bringing up transparency, which isn't as common 
in that there's more customer communication? Is that what you're trying to dive into? Like for yep. people to be able to see visibility into their order process, right? Just like I can order on Amazon and know where the box is. Exactly. That's a huge part of it. The the actual communication from the customer, I think, is something people forget about. But it's it makes their experience so much better, and they're so much more willing to forgive when something does not go exactly as planned. When you've kept them in the loop, and when you've been uh, answering their their questions and uh, honestly and truthfully, and they're also seeing. The, the status of their order whenever they choose. If they, you know, if it's 10 o'clock at night, they can say, oh, well, hey, where's my order at? Oh, okay, we're, you know, I forgot to approve it. You know, I forgot to prove the proof. Okay, cool, let's let's get that approved and, you know, move, on, move along with our day. Got it. So there's value there. Are there any other areas that you feel like you were trying to add value other than the speed transparency or maybe even deeper into those areas? Yeah, I think there's a huge disparage of what, you know, of the people who cannot buy 50 shirts or 100 shirts or 1,000 shirts at a time, there's a huge market there that needs to be served. You know, with they're looking for six pieces, 12 pieces, we feel like, okay, well, there is a market there. And a lot of these people are willing to pay for that service, you know. But the problem is, is in the traditional model of a person walking into your shop, picking out shirts, you know, you have to quote it out, you have to do all these things you can't charge enough for your time. However, there's a lot of those people who are willing to do that work online, but you have to have the resources and tools for them to use the, uh, to go through that process. You know, so that was another thing. It was like, well, hey, we don't, we don't really have a showroom here. We don't really allow people to come in. We have a showroom, but that's just for like our, some of our higher end uh, clients so that we could bring them in and show them some decoration techniques and things like that. But we don't really want that, tra- that traffic inside of our shop, but we definitely want that traffic online, you know? So it was mostly like, how can we give the same quality of product we're giving to some of our higher end customers to uh, a person who's just getting started or somebody who's just doesn't have enough capital to put up the money to get that big run to get that cost down low. So, so, do you feel that your is it really the average order size you see decreasing and so that's where you're trying to get ahead of it by being a very capable you know direct to garment or, or uh, like type of printer to be able to have them go online design the products and stuff and then you guys are shipping out you know call it five ten pieces or so do you see the shop then trying to trend more towards lower quantity orders? Or I feel like what a lot of the shops see this struggle as, as what you said, you can't charge enough for the time. Now, of course, you got to make it a lot more efficient of a process with the art approval and the code approval and all this back and forth before the job's even printed. Is the goal to shorten that as much as possible then for Stoked On and then be able to handle that market? Yep. Exactly. That, that, that's exactly what we're trying to do is build tools that automate a lot of those things that we're, we were doing manually before, you know, like the quoting process, the ordering process and all of those types of things. How do we get um, from a customer's order, you know, they, they are willing to give us money to uh, the press as fast as possible. So that's really trying to, to whittle down all those steps in between. And what tools can we then build in, you know, on the internet? Let's just say, you know, what type of software and what type of tools can we build along the way that automate a lot of those processes and speed up and get it sped up? How's that been going? Good. It's uh, it's just a different world. You know, we were kind of speaking to it a little bit briefly before we got going here on the podcast. But, you know, before it was just, you know, hey, we were... Um, you know, some band guys that were printing shirts and now it's like, okay, well, hey, now we're actually becoming like more of a technology company that just so happens to print shirts. Like that's our product into the world. Um, But it's becoming so much more based on technology. You know, know, now we have three full-time developers that are just constantly working on, you know, products and updates and, you know, websites. Software developers. Yeah. Yeah. So we have have a team of three. Yeah. So we're... um, I uh, have, you know, some road, you know, in learning like what's a roadmap and like, you know, what are milestones and, you know, like getting version, you know, updates out and all those things that you just never, you never learn, you know, when you're 
a, a screen printer, you know, so now kind of having to learn that side of the business. So it's fun, it's challenging, um, but it's just so cool now to see, it, it's kind of a similar idea, you know, with screen printing, because you get to see a process take from, you know, its origins of, hey, I got this idea for a shirt, you know, all the way down to the dryer, when that shirt's finally coming out of the dryer, and it's a beautiful printed shirt. It's this kind of same kind of thing. It's, you know, when we're talking about software, we're like, hey, what if, wouldn't it be cool if we could do this? And then, okay, well, how do we do that? Well, we need to do this, this, and this. And then you are using the product, you know, and sure. you start, you get to play with it and you get to see it uh, working. It, it brings the same kind of amount of joy as, you know, seeing a nice printed shirt coming out. Yeah, that's very interesting. I have definitely seen some shops that have done a very good job of, using garments as the bridge like what you're talking about being a tech company but uh you're using shirts as is the bridge to get from point a to point b and it's been interesting especially in the live printing area i, I mean i think family industries has, has done a, a very good job obviously no live events really happening right now though they've pivoted to some other stuff but their view is more like agency using shirts just like yours is yep tech using shirts so it's just kind of fascinating to see that pivot and that transition into it do you think this you know covid really pushed that forward for you or was this already in play you know or or what really altered over the last couple months here 18 to 24 months ago uh, my partner and i we were like how do we get into print on demand because we saw that and we saw the idea behind it is just like an insane value proposition for a customer. It's like, instead of having to bulk order all of your stuff, we send it to a 3PL or we send it to you and you fulfill all the orders and all of those types of things. We're just going to fulfill the order as it's ordered. You know, we're going to print that, ship it in a couple days. So we saw that and we saw some, you know, I, I ran into a guy, I, I would say it was about three years ago. Um, and he was the owner of a company called DTG to go. And he was telling me what they're doing. And I was like, this is unbelievable. This is going to change the game of, of what we think, you know, printing t-shirts and buying uh, online and selling online is going to be. So we, you know, we started that journey and that's where we really started. We're like, oh, wow, you know, we're going to need to have a lot of tech, you know, because that's the only way is to automate all of these things. So, and even up until last year, I was still having to convince some people to, that print on demand was a good idea because they're like, well, man, I don't know. It's more per shirt, this and that it, it's, you know, th there was, there was a lot of like hangups and there was a lot of uh, false beliefs that I had to break down um, with COVID. It completely accelerated that whole world. You know, people who didn't want to sell online or selling online, people who used to have a huge warehouse and a huge inventory. Uh, don't have that inventory anymore and they're just doing print on demand and there's just a huge shift into the e-commerce world and whether it was people who were there uh, but didn't want to do print on demand or people who are not even selling online are now there and I don't think it's ever going back you know I think people are now seeing like okay this is the way of the future you know is to sell online and with with uh, companies like Shopify, Big Commerce, you know Etsy and all these things making it so easy for you to sell online, it's just gonna get more and more prevalent, I would say. Sure, that makes sense. What would have been some hiccups for you guys trying to make this transition? Figuring out how to connect to an e-commerce store is just a, is a hurdle in itself. <laughs> um, you know, so because, and you know, making, sh how do you get, you know, good artwork and then, you know, getting it all the way down to the printer so that you're really touching it once again, the least amount of times because the, you know, each time somebody touches it, your margin just went down, you know? Sure. So, okay. Like, and so and once again, it's a completely different way of thinking than screen printing because screen printing is very, uh, there's a lot of variables. There's a lot of things. There's a lot of a, a little, a little bit of a person's touch, you know, every time, you know, you, you really want to really experience operator so that he knows, okay, the squeegee pressure, the angle, all these things. Um, whereas, print on demand with DTG, it's a very systemized process. It's like this, 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 you know, and you just need to have the processes and the layout for it to, to function well, you know. Is there equipment that you recommend for folks that are looking to get into it? Um, you know, some of the smaller DTG or are you guys messing around with some of the larger 
like cornets or digital squeegee types or uh, I think was it the rock now the rock now yeah, yeah that's the weirdest thing about the DTG space because in screen printing we have a very um I don't know I guess like a staircase of equipment costs right sure. you could start on the really low end and you could kind of like you know take a step up take a step up until you're buying like a huge expensive machine with DTG it's like okay like you have your kind of entry level you have your like a little bit bigger of entry level and then you have like a huge jump you know you're going from thirty thousand yeah. dollars to four hundred thousand dollars you know and there's really not really anything in between you know so uh we did like a lot of cost analysis and the rock now is actually a really good machine and it's a really good um operating cost and everything about it's really good it's just a really expensive machine so you're you're putting out a ton of money and some of these machines are only doing 100 to 200 shirts an hour. So you're putting up a ton of money to do a low amount of shirts per hour. So what we did is we actually opted for, we just got a new batch in of uh, the GTX Pro Bs. So that's the bulk ink system. And it's really cool. We ran a lot of the numbers on it because it does take a lot more labor than something like the Rock Now or the Coordinates or the Oval Jets of the world. But once you factor in the amount of money you would have to put up your cap, your cap X to put in, uh, you're really about the same. So we figured, hey, let's just like, we're still relatively new into this space, right? So we're, we're kind of uh, trying to make the most uh, bang for our buck, as well as making sure we're, we don't get too upside down if something were to happen. You know. Sure. So with that brother, did you guys just purchase one or is it like multiple that are running at the same time? Yeah, we have nine right now. So how, so how did that nine. work with people? Did, did you augment it with the screen print side and that team or, or is it hiring new folks and training there? How did that work? We specifically hired screen printing people for this. It's a lot simpler of a process as uh, screen printing. Um, but you still need to have like the basics of like loading a shirt straight, loading a shirt consistently, knowing like when things are at a register or a crooked print and like the quality control of it. Because what we're trying to do, what we're trying to bring to the, the DTG world is the closest experience to a screen printed shirt as possible. So the way we found was if we could bring in screen printing people, they're going to know like, hey, this thing is looking really funky, like, stop, sure. you know, so, um, yeah, so we actually brought in almost everybody from either another part of our screen printing uh, operation or from other shops that um, were laying people off or, you know, went out of business. Wow, so that was actually good timing then for you, because, you know, obviously a lot of shops were hurting. I mean, what what yeah. was, what was stoked on, like, from call it uh you know march april it w was pretty economically very challenging and then going into the last couple of months yeah like, did you guys um, have some 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 lows and or you know how'd that work oh definitely yeah so just like uh, most people i talked to uh you know the first first quarter of this year was rocking like it was we were way above last year um you know january february and the first half of March, we were doing so much work, you know, and it was really great. It was consistent. Um, and then from like a Friday to a Monday, we went from having a lot of orders coming in to no orders. You know, it was just like, all right, flat line. So we had to immediately act. So we immediately act and we, we went from 43 people down to about 18 people, you know, over the course of two days, you know, we had, we had to lay those people off. Um, just to, because nobody knew what was going to happen. Right. So from there it was, okay, well we've stabilized, you know, what's the next step when we started in 2008, 2009 during the great recession, it really gave us some insight of like, okay, Hey, this is like a really hard time. There's going to be a lot of, uh, hard times in the, in the interim. However, there's going to be so much opportunity. We just need to like keep our eyes peeled and we need to ensure that we're set up that we could take advantage of these opportunities as they present themselves. So um, as we went into April, we're starting to look and we said, okay, let's just start building a bunch of stores like another, a bunch of other shops have done. Um, so we had a really good, you know, push from that, that, that brought us into May. And then that's really when 
the the print on demand, we started getting a lot more customers, you know, working on print on demand because gotcha. we're saying, Hey, this was really great. Wasn't it? And they're like, yeah, like, well, let's just keep doing that. Just keep selling online and we'll just fulfill as the orders come in. They're like, really? Like that's, you know, you can do that. And I'm like, yeah. So do that. We, we, we grabbed a pretty big app that we're fulfilling for. So then that took us up into August. And, and as far as August goes, uh, we, we actually doubled our sales from last year. So, wow. yeah. That's awesome. Congrats, Kevin. Yeah, thank you. No, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was a lot of hard work. Like it was definitely very trying to go double, you know, but uh, it is really nice to see, you know, when you're, when you think back into the end of March, when you thought that, all right, hey, we might not make it through this, you know, kind of thing. Sure, sure, that's huge. What yeah. um, what do you feel like is your your biggest struggle right now that you're working through? Management, man. Like you know, we went from 43 to 18, and as of last payroll, we had 70 people. You know, so we now have up to 70 people. So building that middle management, right? Like having a director of operations and having a you know a chief revenue officer or somebody in that in that sphere to kind of give us better insight to say hey guys you know you might want to try doing it this way or trying it this way so that's really what we're focusing on next is building out having Shane and I and then having you know a you know a really solid team right below us that can help manage and uh, you know inspire and as well as you know make things better for the rest of the team you know because there's only so many hours in the day and there's only so much bandwidth Shane and I have and we're better suited for other things. So Sure. Like hiring for management's tough. Do, do you feel like it you is. have those roles there now or the right people or wrong people or where do you feel like you're at with it? I feel like we have a really good team. However, we need people more experienced than Shane and I. You know, like we have to In the be, different areas. Yeah, there's only so much we know. So, you know, obviously the thing is you don't know what you don't know. Well, I want to bring in people who know those unknowns so that we can kind of uh, get over some of these growing pains. So really trying to uh, find really experienced people that are far more experienced in certain aspects as than Shane and I are. Got it. Got it. Yeah, so. I definitely hear you. I think at Printavo, uh, you know, definitely not 70 word just over 20 now, but breaking out into departments and having somebody that's more senior for each department that has 10 plus years experience has been, like you said, like very beneficial from my perspective, at least to help take it off my plate, but then also from their perspective, because they are able to help like coach and grow their team as well. I mean, it's just been a nice benefit there too. Um, not not a small investment, but, uh, you know, I, I, I see that as like if you were trying to get from, call it five to ten, it's like needing that experience is huge. It is. Yeah. You, and it's something I wish we would have done much earlier on. <laughs> you know, like you said, it's not a cheap position to fill. But if you find the right peop- right person, you know, so we had a director of operations for about six months and he was good um he just had some things that we really needed from somebody else you know so he he came in and he gave us a lot of uh you know it was kind of almost like a consultancy like he came in and he fixed you know some certain things you know he he shed some light on some management things that we needed to work on um but then i think we needed somebody even a step above him as business owners we have a lot of things that we could be working on that doesn't necessarily need to be Okay, making sure that this person's doing what they're what they need to be sure. doing. Sure, operational. We need, yeah, yeah, exactly. We need to be thinking about okay, what does the landscape look like one year, five years, ten years from now, and and how do we how do we navigate that? You know, we need to be steering the ship, not necessarily making sure that the ship is working right. Yeah, that's awesome, Kevin. I I uh, I'm glad we could catch up. I'm glad you could be able to carve some time out to be able to hang out on the the podcast. Um, you guys yeah. can always follow Stoked On Printing on Instagram. They always do some really awesome posts to be able to see inside the shop as well. So I appreciate you guys sharing that too. Thank you so much, Kevin, for being able to join us today. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. Really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs>